Hello, everybody. Um, la I think not the last session of today, but a rather late session uh, with a somewhat complicated title as well, NGOs, foundations, and reporting. What is the connection here? And looking at uh, it struck me uh, preparing for the panel that uh, we have, uh, as I was asked to say, several decades of Newsroom experience on this panel. So everybody has been working in, in a more newsroom focus environment in owned and operated newspapers and, 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 and publishing houses and now we see a big change on, uh, on, on media landscapes, on, on, on platforms that are not owned and operated anymore by, uh, by news outlets but by people like Facebook and things like this. So journalism is shifting, journalism is moving around the ecosystem and it, it, it's not just in traditional outlets anymore where, where you find journalists. So I think uh, we have an open discussion, there's no, there's no slides, we just talk and ask your questions. So what I would like to do first is have everybody quickly introduce himself, herself, what they're doing, and then uh, I have some questions here, but we might also open the floor rather quickly to, to your questions here. So I would start with Gabriella on that side, and then everybody has a quick introduction of what he does. And okay. Here I'm Gabriella Stern. I'm Director of Media and External Relations for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation based in Seattle. I joined the foundation three months ago. Before that, I was a lifelong journalist. Uh, most recently, about, I spent about 25 years at the Wall Street Journal in uh, different reporting and editing roles around the world. Um, I'm on this panel because we do grants to news media. Uh, around the world that focus on the issues we care about, which are global poverty, development, and not particularly relevant to today, but U.S. education. Um, and the, the title of this panel is Crisis. Well, there is a crisis of poverty um, in many parts of the world, and we want um, different audiences to be aware of these issues uh, so they can be informed and even take action. Andrew, you go. Sorry, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Strohlein. Is that on? Yeah, and I am from Human Rights Watch. Uh, before that, I was with the International Crisis Group, and before that, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. All three of these NGOs uh, are right on the front line of this change that we've seen as NGOs have increasingly been taking on a crisis reporting role. Um, it's interesting from a, a a large number of aspects which we'll get into, but just I'll, I'll put out one or two now. Um, one is just staff. I mean, the people we are hiring at all of these organizations have tended to be experienced journalists who were working in war zones and working in, in difficult areas around the world and that have come into uh, dealing with human rights or dealing with conflict resolution um, or dealing with media freedom. Uh, and, and those are the kind of people were actually hiring, so I'm surrounded by all of these people who have sort of moved from journalism into kind of, I don't know, I would say, I would call it journalism plus. <laughs> uh, my name is Jean-Paul Martos. Uh, I was a journalist first for a couple of decades before joining Human Rights Watch <laughs> and then going back into journalism. So to some extent, I'm an illustration of the hybrid nature of our the current state of affairs in journalism. Today, I'm, uh, I'm the correspondent in Brussels uh, for the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is based in New York and, and sort of monitors press freedom around the world. But I'm still a journalist as well. I'm, I'm still a columnist for Le Soir, which has been my paper uh, for many, many years. And I'm writing for uh, think tanks, uh, foreign affairs reports that I consider acts of journalism. 
Hi, my name is Rachel Jolly. I'm the editor of a quarterly magazine called Index on Censorship. Um, we are a global magazine that covers freedom of expression issues, which, as many of you are journalists, you'll know that that's pretty much everything in journalism. Uh, we have uh, correspondents around the world and five, or six, five contributing editors in places including Turkey, South Africa, and Argentina. Um, I started off as a newspaper reporter um, covering hard news stories on a daily basis, um, worked in many kinds of media over the years, and also like Jean-Paul, took uh, five, six years out working for think tanks in a research, editorial, um, publications, and communication, social media, all those kind of things. Um, I've been working in broadcast for 20 years. I'm now director of the European Journalism Center, so have I left the newsroom? Yes, have I left journalism? No. The question is, I think, as journalists, we started off with this, you know, detached view on things, and now we do advocacy, in a sense, or we have an issue we want to get across. How does that sit with this notion of objectivity, of being uh, equally detached to everybody? You want me to go? You want to go? Um, look, when you do, to be a good news reporter or editor, you just have to be accurate and fair and deep and probing, and you can do that if you're an advocacy journalist or you can do that if you're a more mainstream journalist. You just have to do good work, be decent about it, and so on. Um, at the foundation, at the Gates Foundation, some of our grants are to mainstream media, so to, so to speak, that have more of the traditional protocols of attempting to be neutral and objective. And some of them are to slightly more issue-oriented news organizations. Um, the key is to just make sure that they're principled professionals. Um, we actually don't, are not very hands-on with the journalists. So, once we give a grant to a news organization to cover, let's say, women and girls issues, or global health issues, or agriculture, or whatever it is, once we've established the broad parameters, we actually trust them to do what they're going to do, and we don't contact them on a daily basis and say, oh, we didn't like that story, or, you know, we're going to yank that grant if you don't do a story we want. We, we are neutral and hands-off, and the reason we can be is because there are plenty of news organizations out there across the spectrum that are credible and serious. And some of them are traditional, some of them are non-traditional. I mean, there's this discussion about constructive journalism or, or journalists who, have, who want to change things for the better instead of just reporting the mess, as it were. Well, just to say really quickly, and then I won't dominate, uh, we find actually that audiences respond and are very engaged by what, what's some people call solutions journalism. Very often some of the most effective stories are the ones where the reader or the audience um, feels, oh, I can do something, or something can be done, or there's an action you can take. And you can do objective journalism, but provide options for solutions to people. They're mm -hmm. not incompatible. Go ahead. No, Don't sure we'll go in order. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah. First of all, the notion of objectivity uh, in journalism is extremely uh, is extremely culturally based. If you look at, there are different cultures of journalism in different languages, even within languages, between different countries. Um, just because of the specific histories that different countries have and have developed. Um, for, for my part, I I think um, as you've said. Fairness, accuracy, transparency, as long as it, those things are, are, are clear, then, then you're fine. You're, you, you can be writing for an NGO, you can be writing for a media outlet in the strictest sense of the word, um, and it doesn't really matter as long as the reporting uh, is good. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, just one, one example. I, when I worked with Le Soir, uh, which is a Brussels newspaper, which was... Um, I mean, which has a very strong, I would say, political positioning in the sense that it was a paper close to the resistance movement during the Second World War, for instance. So it came with a strong tradition of defending uh, civil rights, for instance. When I was the foreign editor, we organized uh, 
a partnership with Amnesty International in our cam cam campaigning model of journalism, which was trying to free journalists around the world. So we selected six countries together with Amnesty International. Uh, we, there might be some hope that we could Im improve the situation of jail journalists, perhaps, perhaps even have their freedom. Uh, and then we sent journalists to each of those countries to visit uh, those journalists, write a story about their case. Uh, it was a very nice partnership in the sense that we were able to uh, benefit from the expertise and the contacts of Amnesty International, and they were able to benefit from the sort of a credibility of not being a sort of a uh, advocacy NGO, but being a, uh, a newspaper with strong values, but still a newspaper responding to the criteria to define fairness, impartiality. It went to the point where we were able to visit all those uh, jailed uh, prisoners, I mean, all, all those prisoners, but it, it happened that uh, uh, there was something wrong in the way uh, uh, one, one of the, of the, of the, of the journalists had been freed, uh, despite the fact that uh, it still was listed as uh, a member of the... And so we, 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 we were very transparent uh, with Amnesty, and, and we discussed, we kept our own standards uh, we, we try to we try to, 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 to sort of uh, make sure that we still were not the spokesperson of Amnesty International, which is a great organization, uh, but that we were working with them, sharing the same value, but at the same time keeping our own role as a newspaper, uh, being able even to be critical sometimes of some positions taken by Amnesty International, and sometimes in our editorial positions, we were not always on the same wavelength. Uh, then Amnesty International, though we respected the organization. This is just to show how to try to balance out, I mean, uh, advocacy, because many media, by the way, are advocating uh, things. But neutrality in the media is, is very often it's a mirage, or it's a hypocrisy. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make sure that you keep your standards when you work with organizations that do, do not have journalism as their mandate, but has something else, which is brilliant, like human rights, uh, like, like, of course, human rights watch, or like Amnesty International. I think one point that we're all talking about is storytelling, and I, I guess it's pretty clear that lots of people in different ways are telling stories, whether they're charities, NGOs, journalists. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about telling a story about a, a situation or you know, whether it's, uh, you know, shootings in, you know, somewhere or the fact that a series of people have been targeted or an illness or, or various stories. I think um, NGOs don't necessarily do that in a different way to, to journalists. I mean, the best ones will recognize that um, the clarity of the story, a personal story, is very effective at... Um, uh, getting people to understand um, what's happening and, and creating empathy. That goes on in newspapers and, and in the media and has done, you know, as long as I can remember, there was always, you know, here's the data, here's the numbers, here's a person and that this has happened to who's going to tell you about it. I mean, the combination it continues to be really effective and um, just because people respond in different ways to numbers and to people. Um, I suppose what we're talking about here is that there are maybe more actors, maybe di more different types of organizations um, telling stories. I mean, there's certainly newspapers and uh, working closely with um, NGOs in the field, say in, in you know, um, ones like charities like Save the Children, work closely with newspapers in terms of highlighting some of the migration crisis. But I'm not sure that is particularly new. I'm, I, you know, I feel like that's been happening in different ways for a long time. Um, you mentioned something about uh Journalism Plus. There's these colleagues, they have this Journalism Plus Plus, and they say that one of the, the, in their manifesto, one of the, the points is uh, journalism has left the newsroom. There's acts of journalism committed everywhere. It doesn't have to be in the framework of, of a traditional media organization. Also, I think this notion of objectivity, especially the newspapers, have always had a political position, at least in Europe, a very clear political position, which were allowed to, they never pretended to be impartial. It's a different issue for public broadcasting, maybe, because this is a general audience. But the newspapers, even in Germany, were not so opinionated as in England. Uh, even there, the newspapers usually have a, a position, a value proposition themselves, or the editorial staff. So it is, there is no objectivity. No. I think what, what you said with transparency, having a 
as long as you're transparent about what you do and who's, who's, who your donors are and what your aims are, uh, that's as far as, as you can get. Uh, I was wondering about, maybe starting with your index on censorship, how much censorship is involved in the NGO with reporting? How much you want to shape the message since you have a remit to shape the message? I mean, we, we're commissioning people to write a story. I mean, the, the, the work that I do, I'd say, is, is, is strong journalism. You know, what I'm asking people who, I'm commissioning people who are mostly journalists, some academics, to um, illuminate a subject. So, you know, can you go and research the subject? I want to, you know, tell the story of what's happening in um, Turkey to academics who are being threatened for uh, teaching about Kurdish history, let's say. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm commissioning someone to write that and um, bring to that facts and uh, interviews in the same way that I would be if I was a news editor on the Times and wanted to, someone to um, do that story. So I think actually that's very similar. Just one of the new things that I see in the development of the information uh, ecosphere, I may say, is that uh, uh, NGOs today, the best of them, uh, the ones that are really providing information and analysis to uh, public opinion directly, they have been adopting um, been the same standards very often that journalists pretend to respect. For instance, working with the Committee to Protect Journalists, I was asked to write a report about the European Union in relation to press freedom. And there was no um, a priori at the beginning. It was not like some... UK tabloids, when they cover the European Commission, is they come just to destroy the European Commission. So they are journalists, and no one questions that they are journalists. Whereas CPJ would not be considered, although it's called Committee to Protect Journalists, would not be considered as a media. But the way they asked me to cover that story was, do it the best you can, be fair, be impartial. We don't want to slam or bash, or we just want to make sure that we understand better the role of the European Union, positive or negative, in media freedom issues. So it was very close to what, for, very close to the reason for which I joined journalism when I was a kid and dreaming about journalism. The fact that I was allowed to do my job without any pressure, uh, and to be fair, interview everyone and discover this thing that at the beginning I, I didn't believe in, that I came in my own a priori and prejudice, I discovered that I was wrong. And that, had the freedom to change it. This is what I consider journalism. And to make sure that the, my job as a journalist working on that kind of report was clear, they asked me not to go into recommendation. The recommendations, they had to be written, drafted by the staff members of the, the CPJ because they are the ones de defending uh, the mandate and the principles of the organization. So they make a separation between the two. And if I can just I would, uh, Andrew can certainly uh, go further on this. When I was with Human Rights Watch, I remember that there was a wall, uh, like a state versus church wall, between the research, which had to be of the best quality, without any influence from the advocacy part, where the tendency, of course, is always to try to bend to some extent the research result in order to make the advocacy easier. Uh, so, and there was a, a real wall, and I think that's why Human Rights Watch uh, has become such a reference in terms of the quality of its information, because they've been able to make a real separation between the journalistic side, if I may say, and, to, and the other side, which is as important in democracy, which is advocacy, but without mixing the two. Yeah. And it's, and it's, a, it's a situation we have and discuss really every day. I mean, when a, a new report is about to be launched, and I just had a, a meeting just now, just before this, a conference call, you know, we're, we're discussing a new report, and from the media perspective or the advocacy perspective, uh, there are people on a, in a conference call who say, you know, can we say this? This will, this will really make an impact with this certain group here, this will be very good for this group of journalists, or this government uh, would be very interested to hear this sort of thing. And you know, the researcher says, well, that's not what we found, you know, so that's just not good. So okay, we don't do that, you know, we, we can't, we, we, we can say what we can say, 
uh, and we can uh, and we can report what we've found, but we can't go beyond that. And also, you know, we're we're very often pushed. Um, I am as a spokesperson. Uh, I am pushed by journalists. You know, can you comment on this? Can you comment on this other thing? And you know, if we haven't done the research, if we haven't got the facts from the ground, and I don't have a you know a researcher who has done work on that issue, then I have to disappoint people and just say no, we can't comment on that. And you know, that, that's every day. I mean, that's, that's we can we can say what we can say and what we know, but we can't go beyond that. Just to add, so at the foundation, we obviously believe in and advocate for certain things, uh, eliminating gender inequ inequities. Um, promoting vaccines for and, and R&D um, for terrible diseases and so on. But in terms of uh, our grants to media, I think I would always prefer a quality news organization that is covering our issues and uh, in a way that we might not even agree with 100% of the time, but it's deeply reported and very nuanced. I think that's going to always be more, um, that's going to advance our interests more than if we only funded um, the, the narrow uh, advocacy journalists who are more, they're more to push and lobby for things than they are to, to, um, to report because the audiences are always going to respond to and believe the nuanced uh, probing journalism than they are the advocacy journalism. So we, so that's why we kind of put put our grants out there to the credible news organizations rather than try to censor them or restrict them or somehow steer them. Um, before before we open it up to the floor, maybe one more question. A lot of young journalists in the room. What does it mean if I'm starting out in in, in the in the business in a profession? Should I should I just go? to you guys, or should I maybe start in a newspaper, or should I start in radio and do something orthodox journalism first before I do Human Rights Watch, or you're hiring people off, <coughs> or out of university, of J school, or you, you're looking for a track record of 10 years experience as a normal reporter? Well, I'm just gonna take, we don't hire journalists at the foundation, but as somebody who's very old and started doing uh, reporting at age 11, I think all of you should just dive into um, journalism in whatever shape, way, shape, or form it is. I do think there's a virtue to spending some time in a somewhat established newsroom where you can have mentors. It's really important to have, to start out your career, maybe the first 10 or so years, and be around uh, editors who are very experienced, who will sit with you and teach you and who will criticize you and sometimes they'll make you cry and you'll remember everything they ever said. I can remember I, a mistake I made in the fall of 1982. <laughs> I remember every correctable mistake I ever made and I remember mistakes I made that an editor caught that never required a correction because he or she caught it and we fixed it before it went into publication. So whatever you do, make sure you have the right editors and bosses who will mentor you and and teach you what you need to know. Yeah, I, I, I get asked the, the question a lot, you know, from, from young journalists, or we have, uh, we have interns who work with us, or volunteers who work with us. And, yeah, so how to, how to get a start in journalism? And I always say, have you, have you considered investment banking as a career? <laughs> There's a lot more money in it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, f judging by the way we hire people, and by just, just by facts of how we hire people in our, as researchers and as communications people, um, it's much better to have some journalism experience uh, under your belt first, and uh, also to have field experience. I mean, for us, for the most important thing that, that we look at really is, you know, uh, have you got experience in the field in our kind of issues and languages? You know, can you speak the languages of the countries that we're, you're working on? that we want you to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in my case, in a, in a nutshell, I mean, I can perhaps illustrate the, the state of the market. CPJ is hiring journalists <laughs> and lawyers to protect journalists. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And my paper is firing journalists and hiring lawyers to, to manage the firing, firing of the journalists. <laughs> so, but anyway, <laughs> it shows you something is that uh, 
when I was a young foreign editor at Le Soir, I had 15 people in my team. Today, this paper that I really respect is my paper of, in my heart. I mean, it's still there. Seven people working for the foreign desk. And in between, you have seen the growth of those uh, organizations like Human Rights Watch, like Amnesty also, that they had developed the same kind of approach to the news on crisis reporting. They go where people but journalists don't go. I mean, when I was a young journalist in the, in the, in the 80s in Central America and the drug wars in Latin America, I used NGOs as sources. Uh, I, I used MSF to know about refugees. I, I used, uh, uh, already at the time, Human Rights Watch, Amer called America's Watch, to know about human rights violations by uh, all the actors in, in the conflict. But I was there sometimes for three weeks as a journalist in Nicaragua or those countries. Now, if I compare people that succeeded me in the paper, they go to those countries that they cover less and less and for very, very, very short periods of time. And so the hole that has been created in, in the need for news has been to some extent taken over by those kinds of organizations like Human Rights Watch and others. And it shows you uh, to some extent uh, the perspective. Although I'm personally, I would like to be 25 years old today to, to create journalism again because you are, I mean, the young people are in a great moment uh, in terms of uh, rethinking the philosophy of journalism and uh, using all the technologies that I didn't have. I mean, I used pigeons at the time, you know, uh, to send my articles back to Belgium from, from Nicaragua. So I think it's a great moment, but it's a very anguish, anguishing moment because of the economic basis has not been totally confirmed. But it is true that I don't see, and I just uh, for, uh, for I, I, I don't see that much contradiction between what I was doing as a journalist in a newspaper or on a TV station or whatever, with what I had been doing or what I had seen being done by researchers at Human Rights Watch. And sometimes the best example of journalism was done in NGOs that were seen as non-journalistic, but the criteria uh, they used the resources they had allowed them to uh, be happier as researchers than journalists on mainstream media with decreasing resources. Uh, so, your choice. <laughs> I, I would say um, work out what everybody else doesn't have and get those things because, um, you know, there's a wealth of people who want to be journalists who have the same set of skills. There's a shortage of journalists with great knowledge about science. There's a, you know, so science and journalists, you know, you could be in demand or, you know, law and journalists, things that journalists have traditionally come from the sort of arts background. So, you know, try and do things that other people don't, like, you know, learn languages that other people, you know, that are quite, quite rare and you have a better chance of um, getting a job. Maybe one remark on that as well, what has changed is, uh, it used to be a very lonely job. It was me against the typewriter, me against the machine. <laughs> now you see much more collaboration. All the new projects we see are based on groups of people doing, uh, pooling forces, pooling competences, doing it together. You cannot be a, a data journalism uh, guy and be the most beautiful visualizer and being writing a very good copywriter at the same time. It's very rare instances. So what we see now is the teamwork is getting so much more important. And it used to be my story. I remember we did a, a training with a Reuters guy from the Reuters news agency, and he said, never share a source. Keep the source to yourself. And this is like the old paradigm that is over. You, you, now you try to share as much knowledge as you have with, with, with people who are interested in this. And it used to be my little source, and I would hide it from everybody else. And this has changed fundamentally, and I think it has changed for the better, actually. Uh, any questions from you guys? Part of the there you go. There's a mic here somewhere. I don't know. Is there a microphone? Do you want to just come up? Thank you. Just speak. <laughs> There's one. <coughs> the mic people have disappeared. Somewhat daunting. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Hello. It's not daunting. Come on. My question is. What type of agreements do you think need to exist between journalists and NGOs where NGOs are facilitating journalists' access 
to conflict zones. So often the only way a journalist can get into certain areas of Syria or South Sudan is by embedding with an NGO. Uh, there are issues around that. What kind of agreement do you think needs to be on the table before that trip is made? <coughs> I, 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 it's a really good question, um, and it, a lot of it's extremely situational and kind of ad hoc, to yeah. be to be honest, because the situations are so different. Even in a, if, even in one theater of, of war, for example, you know, even in Syria, whether you're trying to get to this place or that place, um, and and the fact is, as a as a human rights organization, we're not necessarily on the ground in the way as a, as a human humanitarian organization is. So I can't even really speak to to that. Um, exactly, but I'll, I'll tell you, it's 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 something that has to be negotiated, and I mean, the implication of your question is it has to be set out and, and be clear ahead of time, uh, and I would totally agree with that. Yeah. No, I think the, one of the issues for John, I, I take the position as I'm, I'm really deep in my heart a journalist, so I will speak from there. Uh, I think that one of the conditions we to work with uh, NGOs is that uh, whether you they, they help you to cover their story or to cover the story. Uh, uh, that's a big issue. I mean, if, if, if they invite you, uh, they facilitate access of it, and just to make sure that they will, you will cover their own, uh, I mean, sometimes great work, I mean, in, in, in areas of conflict, uh, that's different than when they help you, you know, in a pro bono basis, if I may say, just to help you because they, they have a policy of helping journalists because they want that the story gets out. It's a different thing. I mean, the, the most dangerous thing is when you, you are seen you are, you, are, you are seen by the communications department uh, of, of those big NGOs as basically selling, selling the message that they are great and that people should uh, contribute to, to, to their work by giving money. And sometimes it's difficult for, for people to understand. If, if the person is a former journalist, this makes experience, usually they tend to understand your own perspective. If they come from a uh, communications uh, field, they, they, they don't see you journalists as someone having some particular uh, standards to respect on that view, and sometimes you can have tensions between uh, NGOs and and, uh, and journalists on where to go, for instance, what to cover, uh, whether we should reveal that there are some failings in the NGOs. I, I, personally, I'm in favor of transparency. So first of all, journalists should say they have been invited by an NGO, which is clearly. Uh, they, they, should, they should make sure that they have their own autonomy in, 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 in uh, defining what they are going to cover, where they are going to go, a uh, thing like this. So it's a, it's a, as, as Andrew said, it's an it's a ad hoc arrangement, but it's on the principle that journalists are not there to do the PR for the NGO. Although we understand sometimes that the NGO is doing a great work, doesn't mean that we are there to do their PR. Uh, so. there's, a, there's, a mic. there's a mic there's a here, actually. Hi, I'm uh, Shujai Gupta. I'm an editor of a newspaper from India in Goa called The Herald. Uh, my question is, uh, particularly in the, in the developing world, like in, like in India, uh, often uh, when you are looking at human rights, uh, you're also looking at the violators, and the violators often happen to be people in power, for instance, the, the government or the police and so on and so forth. And the typical human rights violations that happen in India is, for instance, there's a great drought happening in parts of Maharashtra and there's no compensation for people. Or you have police brutalities that uh, don't get kind of uh, solved because of the state is completely involved. Uh, in the sense that uh, I wanted to get a sense of how you all deal with violators in the Western world. Uh, are they the same kind of violators? If yes, how do you deal with them? If no, who are the, who are the violators here? Well, I guess that's to me. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, it's a really uh, interesting question and uh, you know, one that, uh, I mean, it just has so many aspects. As Human Rights Watch, we are based in New York it, and uh, that brings some criticism from some sides that, you know, okay, well, it's an American organization. Actually, we have more staff outside the U.S. than in. Um, and the country we actually report on violations the most and which we have the most staff dedicated to examine the violations of is the US. We actually report more on the US than, than any other country um, and their violations. So that's actually surprising to a lot of people. Um, I mean, every country is different and that's why we have to have experts who actually know the country, understand the languages, know its history, um, can interact with the culture and understand um, not just 
not just how to talk to people and how to get the information from people in a, in a, in a secure way and not get people into trouble, but also in a way that's going to deliver information that's useful from an advocacy perspective to know what will actually work with policymakers in that country because what works with policymakers in India may not work with policymakers in Brazil and may not work with policymakers in Canada. I mean, you know, we, we, we try to take an approach of you know, needing to understand what's actually, what's actually going to work. Um, and that's why we, we you know, where our, our, our value, our real value is in this network of, we used to call them foreign correspondents if we were a media organization, uh, and we call them researchers. No. I, I just wanted to say, um, this is not really a media response, but so the Gates Foundation, um, we, we work in a lot of different countries, principally, uh, well, we have grantees and partners doing health de and development work in many countries, but principally in South Asia and in Africa. And each country and each government and each province and each municipality presents a different challenge or opportunity because you have to, um, your grantee or your partner has to roll out a, a, let's say a vaccination program in a different environment. So for instance with India, um, in the Indian government just rolled out a massively important historic rotavirus campaign. And in some parts of India it's, it's being embraced because children won't die. And in some parts there's real suspicion and some of the suspicion comes from piece, uh, individuals in the public sector, some in the private sector, and it's very challenging. And you have to, and really it's either us or through our partners, you have to navigate it because in the end you have to prioritize the lives of the people you're trying to help. And um, so it's a very tricky, difficult balancing act. Just wanted to say that. Um. I was going to give an example of where a, a story that we, we cover um, about attacks on journalists, for example, sometimes um, they've come, they're facilitated by the state, sometimes they're facilitated by the environment, sometimes they might be facilitated, they might be, you know, coming from sort of gangs or mafia uh, type organizations. I don't, I mean, we try and report on all of that in the same way and, you know, uh, fill in the picture, basically, so we don't, we don't, you know, differentiate in the type of reporting, and the idea being that obviously, by reporting it, you, you know, you hope that by shining a light on it, something might eventually change, or somebody might get shamed into doing something. Can I just add something? I mean, it's a question of credibility for NGOs, but also for democratic, so-called democratic states. If you see, for instance, the European Union, the European Union published two years ago guidelines for all its diplomats in delegations. The, the guidelines on freedom of expression offline and online. One of the first guidelines is the EU is against criminal defamation. And so they, the ambassador of the EU in India or in Thailand is going to say, the EU asks you to suppress those, those laws that are absolutely against freedom of expression. 23 members of the European Union, which count 28 countries, still have criminal defamation laws on their books. Blasphemy. What happens in Bangladesh, for instance, today? If, what, what can the EU ambassador or some of the countries of the European Union say about blasphemy? 16 countries in Europe still, has, still have blasphemy laws. So that's an issue. So it is credibility. I mean, you cannot teach the others if you don't clean your act at home. That's also the philosophy for uh, human rights organization, as, as Andrew said. I mean, Human Rights Watch would not be credible if it didn't focus its attention to violations of human rights in prisons, for instance, in, in the States, when migration policies, things like this. So, uh, can, can I ask a quick supplementary, if, if I'm allowed to? Uh, just one more quick question. If, if I, I just wanted to know this. See, that the work, work that you all, all do, have you kind of uh, mapped whether specific changes have happened? I mean, have you managed to pin down specific changes? And do you feel, can you honestly say that you're living in a better human rights climate uh, since the time you started off. I know it's, it's, it's difficult, yep. but I'm sure you, you do some mapping. Yeah, there's, okay. a short there's a short answer to that and a, and a much longer and difficult and painful answer. Okay. The short answer is yes, we map this. We have, a, we have a group of people who do nothing, basically, but look at impact. So in the, in the NGO world, we call it impact. Don't we love impact? Um, and we do monitoring and evaluation of the impact of our work. Um, 
and and sometimes it's very like it's actually really quick in short term. I mean, literally one tweet changed a government's mind. I can show you an example of that where you know we tweeted something, and within 48 hours, government policy changed, and you know, quick victory, woohoo. Um, other things we work on for years, and we frankly make very little traction with the government involved. I mean, Uzbekistan is a really good example. I mean, the human rights situation in Uzbekistan, um, which I've been interested in, a country I've been interested in for almost 20 years, has really not improved <laughs> at any point in those 20 years. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it's gotten worse. But the really worrying and th uh, aspect of, of sort of the world we're finding ourselves in now is, um, I mean, we're, we've kind of entered this different time where it used to be that governments would come back to us and say, they would just deny our, our report or deny our allegations. We would say, you are committing such and such abuses and we have this example and we have this other example and so on and so forth, 150 page report, 200 page report. And the government would say, uh, no, you're lying or deny the report or just ignore the report or say that we were a front for the KGB or the CIA or whatever. Um, and that, that was kind of the standard approach and then we kind of maybe move them over time a, bit, a little bit later. Now we're seeing governments increasingly simply reject the basic rules of the game. So we used to say, okay, you're torturing people, tortures, and you know, and tortures both immoral and illegal, and they would say no. Now they're saying, well, you know, kind of torture, eh, maybe we should rewrite the rules a little bit and look at that again. And that's really worrying. Because that, I mean, it undermines, of course, <laughs> the way we're used to working, but it also undermines the basic human rights approach that we have all had since really the end of the Second World War. I mean, the, the way that the world has agreed to look at universal human rights. And that's much more worrying because we're not just seeing it in some of the kind of, the, the countries, the known offenders that we expect, but we're seeing it in some of the countries that we would never have expected to see it on. And, you know, frankly, Human Rights Watch is reporting on countries committing violations, countries that we never expected to report on, and violations that we never expected to happen there. And that's extremely worrying. Thank you. Maybe one more comment on this, on this impact issue. I, I think this is also a fundamental difference between the NGO-focused world and, and traditional media. Traditional media, all you would care about is how was the rating last night, <laughs> and that was it. And tomorrow is another news day, and you, you hope for another new rating. You never followed up on the stories, and sometimes you blow something up, uh, and in three days it's still uh, there, but it, it has, the news cycle has changed, so nobody, everybody forgets about it. So this, this, this more long-term, long-tail consideration of issues is something that the traditional media was not interested in at all, because there was no business model for that. I'm going to disagree with that. Because, okay. um, <laughs> <I, I, laughs> you know, it's boring if we all agree with each other. Um, I mean, some laws in, in Britain have been changed because the Daily Mail started a campaign, for instance. You know, they have a long-term agenda. At the moment, it's, you know, uh, to show David Cameron in a bad light because they want Britain to leave the EU. That's a long-term objective, you know. It's, in quite short term at the moment. Um, the Daily Mail started a campaign to introduce um, 5P charges for plastic bags. It, in it, and we now have 5P charges for plastic bags. You know, I think journalism has impact. It has constant impact and some of it's very similar. Um, you know, you might not like the impact. Uh, you can look at newspapers who have a huge impact on government policy, for instance. Um, we have, uh, you know, we, we collect examples where we feel we have impact. So they tend to be stories of people that we've worked with. So we work with a Lebanese playwright called Lucien Borgelli, whose play was banned um, from being performed in Lebanon. Um, we translated some his play. We um, published it for the first time in English. We drew a lot of attention to his case. Um, the next play that he published was not banned. He's now, he has not found it so difficult to get a visa to leave the country. So we see that as a, as a positive impact. Um, just in the last few days, we've been working with an Azerbaijani writer called Akram Alisli. He was stopped at Baku Airport on the way to a literary festival in Italy. And we knew about that almost a couple of hours after it happened, and we were able to do live stories on that. We were, we were actually in the process of publishing a short story that he'd written anyway, so we were working closely with him, so we had the established contacts. That story went 
all over the web. It was um, we were working the, with the Guardian and a number of other publications. I suspect the Azerbaijani government were not expecting the amount of coverage that he, that they got out of that incident. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> part of your vision now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> quote Vivian Schiller on the other panel just in the afternoon. She said, everybody's favorite business model is to find yourself a billionaire. Is to find yourself a billionaire. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's and so the funding, uh, where does the money come from for, for, for this good work you do? I mean, you, you have, you have, you have an, uh, an agenda, you have an agency. How does the funding work? You're not selling subscriptions, are you? All right, so I'll take this because my answer is really easy. <laughs> Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett. And, um, but actually, um, what's interesting is, so one of the things they did was launch something called the Giving Pledge. And they are really asking other really, really rich people around the world to commit uh, a big chunk of their money to um, charitable work. And it's uh, picking up steam, and you've seen the most high-profile people who just committed their um, rather sizable wealth were um, are Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. So um, just a, a point, so that's an obvious thing, Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, what's interesting to me is um, some foundations work with uh, the likes of Ford and Rockefeller, their um, donors are long since gone. And uh, at the Gates Foundation, you're working with living donors, right? The living, they're, they're there, they're involved. And it's a completely different proposition um, to be with an active donor uh, who's highly involved. Um, it makes things extremely exciting and stimulating and energetic. Um, and I, I, think, I think we are very lucky. So anyway, that's me. From our point, as. Um, <laughs> As Human Rights Watch, we uh, have a, a very diversified funding model. We don't take uh, funding from governments. Uh, we tend to uh, identify uh, philanthropists and uh, high net worth individuals, otherwise known as rich people, um, and ask them uh, for, for sizable donations. The, the key, I think, to, I mean, NGO funding people can and do write uh, very long dissertations on this, but the, the key is two things. First of all, diverse, a diverse funding base is very important. You know, if you take uh, a lot of money from a few, uh, a few people, there, there's a risk that, you know, that they have too much influence. Um, uh, you know, if, if people disagree on what you're trying to, to, to accomplish as an organization. Um, so taking uh, money from a wider group of people uh, allows you to, uh, to continue on in your in your goals, and also um, there's a big difference between what we call in the business uh, core funding and project funding, and this, not to get too much into the weeds here, but um, core funding means people give you money, and they throw it into a pot, and then you can take the money out of the pot and do whatever you want with it. And project funding is they give you money and they say, I want you to spend this money on X, uh, on, on, on uh, women's rights in Pakistan or something like that, um, which, which is you know, the most NGOs uh, have to work with a lot of project funding because that's just, that's just the way the world works. Um, and Human Rights Watch and the last organization I was at, the International Crisis Group, were very lucky in that we're about 80% core funded. So the money comes into a pot and then we decide strategic, you know, we, we set the strate strategic priorities as the, as the senior staff, uh, what to spend that money on and, and where to go you know, and how to, you know, what we're going to look at uh, in the future. Um, but again, I want to get back to this issue of transparency. You know, if you're transparent about where your money comes from, and of course we are and other organizations represented here uh, very much are, you can go to websites and you can look, look it up and you can figure out, you know, you can see who the donors are. It's not really, you know, it's not, it's not hidden in any way. Um, in the case of CBJ, it's uh, half of the money comes from the, from the media themselves, and then half of it comes from foundations. And the media, like Bloomberg or Reuters, or they tend to fund the core 
uh, part of the organization, whereas the foundation tend to go for projects, and I agree with uh, your remarks on the difficulty to, to manage projects. It's less easy for an organization to, to do that. I just want to make a new remark. Um, we don't accept money from governments, uh, n nor from, from uh, intergovernmental organizations. But I have to say that uh, in a formal life, I, I, I manage a project in Africa for the International Federation of Journalists, and 80% of the money came from the European Commission. And I have to say, quite frankly, that there was not the least form of pressure on the part of the Commission on the drafting of the project and the execution of the project. Although many member countries, I don't men I would not mention the former colonial, colonial countries, were not too happy with what we were doing. But the Commission defended us. I mean, so, so I, I, I think that, uh, although I, I do respect the fact that in the US in particular, good organizations are a bit nervous about getting money from the state, I think that sometimes you have to recognize that state money is not always with strings attached, that it, it can really help you uh, uh, to do your work and there's not too much, or not even sometimes the least suspicion of, uh, of trying to influence. For instance, when I work for, I work for a, an Oslo-based think tank funded by the Norwegian government, when I did my reports on Venezuela or, or Turkey or, or uh, South Africa uh, and Brazil, the foreign policy, um, I had no, nothing to do with, uh, no one from the government told me, you know, you should be careful because we have relations with Brazil with, or, or, or Venezuela is an oil producing country, we are members of the OPEC together, be careful. Nothing. It was just purely state money. So I, I would be, just to make that, that just uh, not owed to the state, but, but it's not always bad money. Uh, yeah. um. I think a lot of that's been covered already, diversification of funding. I think this is a big question for journalism in general, though. You know, where is the money coming from? Who's going to fund journalism in the future of all types? You know, it's a question that I feel hasn't... I haven't heard that much discussion of it here this, in the last few days, but I think it's a really important one because we've created a culture where people expect, in many ways, not to pay for journalism. So if you, the consumer, are not paying, who is paying is, uh, you know, and there are some models out there, but, you know, um, a lot of editors don't seem very clear where that money is coming from for their future. So I think it's one we really should be discussing more. We do some crowdfunding as well, I'll mention, including we have a new Music in Exile fund, which is helps support musicians who have, uh, like the Malian musicians, for instance, who've been pushed out of their own country. Um, and um, and that was, uh, that's all being supported by crowdfunding. So, Please do donate. I mean, on the other <laughs> panel in the, in, in the hotel uh, room, um, they also mentioned crowdfunding from the correspondent, for example, in Holland, which has been very successful, and also Espanol. There's a lot of mm -hmm. journalist outfits trying crowdfunding or having subscribers, which, which might be the same thing. Get, what it means is getting away from advertisers, basically, because the advertising model is broken. If you find enough, if the society is rich enough to afford 60 euros a year to subscribe to the correspondent, of course, they have, I don't know, 40,000 subscribers. That puts them on a base that makes them sustainable already. Uh, so I think crowdfunding and funding from, we will see a diversity of, of funds coming into journalism. And we, we, we should, uh, why should the advertising money be, be cleaner than the government money? I don't, never saw that because advertisers are notoriously interfering in editorial, um, uh, I will, let's not go into detail here, but uh, <laughs> we had no, I will. <laughs> no, we had a, we had a guy, uh, Opel had some problem with the, with the gas tank, so it blew up if you made the wrong move. So a reporter by accident could film this at a gas station when the Opel blew up again. We, we broadcast it and of course, the next day I had my head of sales in my office what did you broadcast last night? Opel called, they're a big customer here. Uh, and then we repeated it in the news still, so he got even more furious. But of course, <laughs> he, they called him immediately to, to say to take it off the air. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, that uh, other donors uh, are that vicious, actually. Mm -hmm. just, just, it's a reminder, especially for the younger generation. I have my kids, so I know how they consume news. They believe news is for free. No, you, you have to learn that you have to pay uh -huh. to, to make sure that uh, news can be produced independently. Uh, and the fact a subscriber-based 
projects, not crowdfunding, but subscriber-based projects, which is much more stable, uh, like Mediapart in Paris, for instance, they, they, they were able to create a new investigative online daily paper, which has been producing lots of uh, expose on, on corruption and, and uh, just on the basis of, their, of the people paying 10 euros a month. 10 euros a month is two bottles of Coke in, 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 in Perugia, so it's not that much, you know. So, uh, it's one, one bottle of Coke pay. in Perugia. Yeah, okay. <laughs> two two follow-up thoughts. One is absolutely, you have to, as consumers, you have to be willing to pay for content. As producers of journalism, you need to create content that's so distinctive that your audiences will pay for it. And plus, when you create distinctive journalism, that's the whole point of doing journalism. If you're doing the same stuff everybody else is doing, well, why do it? So, it, so um, I absolutely agree. The survival of journalism will be a subscriber model because advertising is cyclical. Donors come and go. Uh, so you have to charge for news. And to charge for news, you need to do great, distinctive, unique journalism. One other thought is, Crucial, more crucial than ever for newsrooms to have ethics and standards uh, departments, editors, principals. You need to have really strict um, guidelines for journalism behavior, the behavior of reporters and editors, and also the behaviors of the business side, so that when an advertiser or a donor complains and says, I'm going to yank my advertising that, that, that the, ad, the ad sales executive cannot force the newsroom to change and so on and so forth. So it's more important now than ever when, when newsrooms are under financial pressure, they have to be extremely principled and, and because otherwise if you distort your journalism for commercial reasons, your audiences are going to run away from you. Mm -hmm. um, final chance to ask a question. Here you go. Hello, um, I'm actually from Journalism Plus Plus, so thank you for acknowledging us. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, um, I had a question to, I guess, to all of the panel about the subscriber model. I can understand how important it is, but uh, I'm just wondering how actually possible it is um, for a consumer, because right now, with the abundance of freely available news, we can read a whole lot of them uh, for free. And the number of publications I, for example, as a young journalist, read online is dozens. Um, but I cannot possibly have dozens of subscriptions, and I don't think anyone can, seriously. It's, people are just lazy, even if they have the money. Mm. So I'm just wondering if, um, if you've ever considered that, thinking about subscription-based. And the second side of the question would be whether you think that um, if we all switch to subscription, the uh, platforms who win will not be the actual publishers, but it will be the platforms like Facebook, for example, or s this sort of organizations that combine the news and that they will monopolize the, uh, the sphere. Yeah. Uh, the fact is, if we don't create distinctive, unique, high-value news and charge for it, and if we continue giving it away and letting it be free on Facebook, we're going to die. Mm. So everybody in the news business has to pull it back in. And we have to do it. Or, and and, and I, see, I see this rush to embrace the likes of Facebook, and, and it's really sad, and it's actually quite pathetic. And, um, and everybody just has to do it, because the original sin was committed in the 90s when the mainstream news organizations all gave their news away, except for mm. the Wall Street Journal, yeah. which yeah. since 1996 has charged for its news online. Belatedly, the New York Times, the FT, and others, you know, in the last five, 10 years, came, tried to rein it back and actually have had some success. I mean, the Times subscription model is mm. fine. Mm. But then you have the likes of The Guardian and Washington Post giving, giving it away. So we have a really messy situation. It's very dangerous for the future of journalism. And people have to have discipline, both to charge for news, but also to not do pack journalism. You know what I mean by pack journalism. Yeah. Kardashians and, and stuff, stuff that everybody else is doing. Do something that 
you're only going to find on this site, because, and then you feel compelled to subscribe as a reader. The, just another point is there is this micropayments model that Blendle and others are playing with, so that you can do a la carte, and that might be a one, uh, it's, it's a little unproven yet, I think, oh, but that's one sure. way to deal with the problem of how many subscriptions can, you, can one person really have. And another example in Holland, it works quite well. You, yeah. you, you're just with Blendl and then you can basically, you, you just pay one outlet and then you can you know, pick and choose what kind of contents you're using. And uh, they give you one for free, even if, you over, if, if your subscription runs out and they let you read two more stories and then they tell you, you've been reading for free for two stories and now it's time to pay. They have a very nice way of user engagement as well. You should also remember things that appear to be free are not necessarily free because we're doing an exchange, aren't we? So like giving away all our personal information so that they can collect yeah. it, so they can use it for marketing and, you know, these things are, you're, you're making, you're bartering stuff here. So while well, things appear to be free, and I, I, might, I think my, in my head there might be a moment when people decide that they don't necessarily want uh, large international organizations to know everything about their life so that they can, you know, market all their information. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like it might come. Just one remark. I mean, I, I, I guess citizens should, should perhaps think about it. I mean, uh, how to, uh, they can contribute by their, by, by paying. I mean, uh, to, 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 to the fact that there would be still uh, independent media. But I think also there's this, I mean, can never trust <laughs> public opinion on this, but let's hope it, they will change. But I think there is a battle that's going on today uh, at, at, at the European level, for instance, with the current commissioner of Starburg, for instance. She, she's pushing for another form of regulation of the media field, which upsets, of course, many of the huge behemoths like Google or, or, or those organizations, trying to create a plurality and pluralism in the media, which, you know, there's, there's certainly an abuse of dominating power. It's, it's a, it's a in terms of trade, it's, it's an issue which can be approached not only to, I mean, not only to values and citizenship, it can be approached via a market, uh, meaning that uh, you cannot have a market with the kind of position that some companies have on fundamental issues for democracy and for us as citizens. And so I believe that uh, at some point there will be rules that will be edicted uh, coming certainly from the European Commission, although some countries are quite, quite confused about supporting it, but also to some extent at the end of the day, perhaps from the US, where the, 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 there's an awareness that you need to have diversity. Uh, and it's, it makes sense in terms of the economy, not only in terms of the principles of democracy. And I, and I do trust, as a very cynical journalist, I do trust more the economic reflex than the, the democratic reflex, if I may say, and I expect uh, that Things will change on that front in the next in next years. I'm more pessimistic there. I think some of the Commission staff specifically wants to keep the status quo as it is, and disruption will not just disappear because you don't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. It will still happen. So you have to shape the disruption instead yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah. trying to stop it. To push for it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, advocate, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I think I, I think I may agree with the uh, with with the questioner a little bit more than some of the rest of the, the panel. I, I, I agree with the, the idealism expressed. I mean, I, I, I think people should be, you know, the general public should be willing to pay for quality news and they should be willing to, you know, and I do think there are some models out there that are, you know, these micropayment systems and others that are trying to kind of square the circle. Um, but I just think the, you know, the generation that is coming up is not used to paying mm -hmm. for, they're used to being the product rather than the consumer. <laughs> you know, if you are, you know, if you are the product when you're on, on Facebook, and I use Facebook all the time, and I, mm -hmm. but I understand that. Um, and if you have some of the quality news organizations drifting into pay only, then a lot of people will follow them into that, but a lot of people won't. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, there's, if they can get their news from, uh, Russia Today, or they can get their news from uh, Press TV, or they can get their news from other, you know, uh, international state-funded broadcasters uh, with an agenda, it, 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 the whole result of, of more quality papers and quality outlets going subscription might be this trend of people going to where they can get news for free from you know, 
what are, in a sense, propaganda machines for states. And that's, that to me is even more worrying. I mean, this is deep territory. Now we go into business models of, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, of the industry. <laughs> I think it is, uh, as a takeaway, it is, it's interesting to see there's crowdfunding, there's subscription-based models, there's NGO support for journalism, and there's also free journalism on the web that, that should be free. And um, uh, everybody's fine with that. So I think we're, we're gonna, our, news will, mix be, of our news will be free. We're, we're gonna, it's a mix of <laughs> things that makes this uh, vibrant. It's uh, the old model, just the advertising model has come to an end. But uh, I think for, for, for representatives of, of a glimpse into the future here on that panel, and uh, we have, I think, five more minutes, so maybe one more quick uh, nasty statement or nice statement or whatever you wanted to say. Here you go. We start with you. No, okay. Um, I feel quite positive about the state of journalism right now. I think there's lots of people, I'm, you know, examples here over the last few days of people doing incredible things. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, you hear a lot of bad things about journalism and journalists. I saw a number about only tw uh, the trust level of journalists going down, but I think that you should also, if you're um, thinking of a career in journalism, feel very positive about some of the excellent work that's being done as well. Uh, I think I've been optimistic, I mean, uh, uh, about the future of journalism, and it's true that in the last uh, years there have been a number of new forms of journalism that I consider very much a uh, hope for, for our future. I mean, what, what happened with the Panama Papers, for instance, the way uh, a number of news organizations across the world were able to be realistic, covering the world as it is, and the world today is global. And, and the way they were able to do so, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It, it d didn't happen when I was a young journalist. I think this is a major progress, that journalists come together, as you said, I mean, they're able to share sources and, and knowledge and, and, uh, and culture and everything, and go and, and and confront the world as it is. It's fa fabulous. And second, I, I believe that uh, sometimes you need just one good media in some countries to, to make a difference. That is, you know, the so-called vanguard media in sometimes countries in transition where you have a newspaper or radio station that suddenly becomes based on the civic-oriented form of journalism that makes a difference in the transition to its more openness, more democracy, is what the case in South Africa uh, during the end of the apartheid with weekly mail, for instance, was the case in Mexico with Reforma, was the case in El País in Spain. I do believe that sometimes you just need one great example of the best in journalism in terms of quality of, the, of, of, of journalism, but also perhaps the advocacy for freedom uh, that they're represented to, to push for change. Uh, it is something which, which I think uh, it's, it, it's also a hope for, 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 for journalism. Journalism is not about only business, it's about values. And Walter Lippmann, who was a famous American columnist, he wrote in 1922 a book that I advise you to read. It's called Liberty and the News. And he said, the crisis of Western democracy is a crisis in journalism. And I think it's absolutely what could be repeated today. Um. If, if we look back a generation in, in, in each of the media markets that, we, you know, that we're from in terms of linguistically or, or nationally, you know, all the people, like our parents or grandparents, I don't know which, which, where gener which generation we fall under, they were watching the same news or listening to the same news in that market at that evening. And you know, so they would turn on the TV and watch the more or less the same evening news or maybe they had two choices in some countries. Um, they would read more or less the same papers, or at least you know, three or four uh, papers maximum in, in any market. And that has just exploded in recent years, and that, pre that presents an enormous challenge for holding polities together, for holding a, a, a group of people, a nation or whatever, um, even a political party, holding a group of people together because everyone is getting their news from a different source. You can sit down a, a generation ago with someone at the coffee shop and the chances are they were looking at the same newspaper you were and you could talk oh, did, about, you know, did you see that article? Of course I saw that article, here it is, and you've seen that and we can talk about, we talked the same, we spoke the same language and the same uh, articles day by day, and that doesn't happen anymore. You, can, you can't find a coffee shop and sit down next to a person who's seen the same thing. You can say, oh, you should see this, and they can go find it, but 
but uh, we, it's just this an incredible explosion of, of sources. Um, and that makes a lot of opportunities for journalism and it's very exciting. Uh, NGOs are playing an ever increasing part of that and you know, I'm happy to be part of that, that segment of the, of the market. Uh, and I, would, I tend to get m more and more of my information from NGOs and NGO funded uh, sources because they, they just seem to be, to me, much more reliable than a lot of other things that are going on. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just an amazing explosion of sources now. And I'll just be very brief. Um, at the Gates Foundation, we describe ourselves as impatient optimists. <laughs> and that is because we're optimistic about eradicating poverty. Um, and we're making incredible gains. I and mean, as you saw uh, uh, with some announcements late last year, we're about to wipe out po uh, polio from the face of the earth, just two more countries. And there's just other, uh, you know, infant mortality is being reduced. There are incredible gains happening, and I would just encourage you to take the incredible multimedia journalism tools that are at your disposal now, and also the amazing reach that all these platforms have in a second you're reaching people across the world. And to write about, to do journalism about poverty, health care, development, agriculture, women's, women and girls uh, equity issues, education, and so on. Uh, these are not, these aren't the Kardashians, it's not football, it's not the sexy stuff, but it's really important stuff. And it can be incredibly gripping if you put a human face on the stories and tell the narratives of people living in abject poverty and coming out of it. The mobility out of poverty is amazing. Uh, so just to encourage you to write about, about uh, these amazing issues and be impatiently optimistic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, we are impatient optimists and being at the festival here is... The journal, the journal. The title of this panel is Crisis. Well, there is a crisis of poverty um, in many parts of the world, and we want um, different audiences to be aware of these issues uh, so they can be informed and even take action. Andrew, you go. Sorry, okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Andrew Strollan. Is that on? Yeah, and yeah. I am from Human Rights Watch. Uh, before that, I was with the International Crisis Group, and before that, the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. All three of these NGOs uh, are right on the front line of this change that we've seen as NGOs have increasingly been taking on a crisis reporting role. Um, it's interesting from a, a large number of aspects, which we'll get into, but just I'll, I'll put out one or two now. Um, one is just staff. People we are hiring at all of these organizations have tended to be experienced journalists who were working in war zones and working in, in difficult areas around the world and that have come into uh, dealing with human rights or dealing with conflict resolution um, or dealing with media freedom. Uh, and, and those are the kind of people we're actually hiring. So I'm surrounded by all of these people who have sort of moved from journalism into kind of I, don't know, I would say, I would call it journalism plus. <laughs> uh, my name is Jean-Paul Martos. Uh, I was a journalist first for a couple of decades before joining Human Rights Watch <laughs> and then going back into journalism. So to some extent, I'm an illustration of the hybrid nature of our, our current state of affairs in journalism. Today, I'm, uh, I'm the correspondent in Brussels uh, for the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is based in New York and, and sort of monitors press freedom around the world. But I'm still a journalist as well. I'm, I'm still a columnist for Le Soir, which has been my paper uh, for many, many years. And I'm writing for uh, think tanks, uh, foreign affairs reports that I consider acts of journalism. Hi, my name is Rachel Jolly. I'm the editor of a quarterly magazine called Index on Censorship. Um, we are a global magazine that covers freedom of expression issues, which, as many of you are journalists, you'll know that that's pretty much everything in journalism. <laughs> uh, we have uh, correspondents around the world and five, or six, five contributing editors in places including Turkey, South Africa, and Argentina. Um, 
I started off as a newspaper reporter. Respond and are very engaged by what what's, some people call solutions journalism. Very often, some of the most effective stories are the ones where the reader or the audience um, feels, oh, I can do something, or something can be done, or there's an action you can take. And you can do objective journalism, but provide options for solutions to people. They're mm -hmm. not incompatible. Go ahead. I don't sure, sure we'll go in order. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah. First of all, the notion of objectivity uh, in journalism is extremely uh, is extremely culturally based. If you look at, there are different cultures of journalism in different languages, even within languages, between different countries. Um, just because of the specific histories that different countries have and have developed. Um, for, for my part, I I, I think um, as you've said. Fairness, accuracy, transparency, as long as it, those things are, are, are clear, then, then you're fine. You're, you, you can be writing for an NGO, you can be writing for a media outlet in the strictest sense of the word, um, and it doesn't really matter as long as the reporting uh, is good. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, just one, one example. I, when I worked with Le Soir, uh, which is a Brussels newspaper, which was... Um, I mean, which has a very strong, I would say, political positioning in the sense that it was a paper close to the resistance movement during the Second World War, for instance. So it, it came with a strong tradition of defending uh, civil rights, for instance. When I was the foreign editor, we organized uh, a partnership with Amnesty International in our cam cam campaigning model of journalism, which was trying to free journalists around the world. So we selected six countries, together with Amnesty International. Uh, we, there might be some hope that we could Im improve the situation of jail journalists, perhaps, perhaps even have their freedom. Uh, and then we sent journalists to each of those countries to visit uh, those journalists, write a story about their case. Uh, it was a very nice partnership in the sense that we were able to uh, benefit from the expertise and the contacts of Amnesty International and they were able to benefit from the sort of a credibility of not being a sort of a uh, advocacy NGO, but being a, journal, a newspaper with strong values, but still a newspaper responding to the criteria to define fairness, impartiality. It went to the point where we were able to visit all those. Um, yeah. But it also, it left a lot of things like oh, the room producer is very good. Just basically, yes. Oh, yes, Hello, everybody. Um, la I think not the last session of today, but a rather late session uh, with a somewhat complicated title as well NGOs, foundations, and reporting. What is the connection here? And looking at uh, it, struck me uh, preparing for the panel that uh, we have. Uh, as I was asked to say, several decades of newsroom experience on this panel. So everybody has been working in, in a more newsroom focused environment in owned and operated newspapers and, 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 and publishing houses. And now we see a big change on, uh, on, on media landscapes, on, on, on platforms that are not owned and operated anymore by, uh, by news outlets, but by people like Facebook and things like this. So journalism is shifting, journalism is moving around the ecosystem and it, it, it's not just in traditional outlets anymore where, where you find journalists. So I think uh, we, we have an open discussion, there's no, there's no slides, we just talk and ask your questions. So what I would like to do first is have everybody quickly introduce himself, herself, what they're doing, and then uh, I have some questions here, but we might also open the floor rather quickly to, to your questions here. So I would start with Gabriella on that side, and then everybody has a quick introduction of what he does. And okay. I'm Gabriella go. Stern. I'm Director of Media and External Relations for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, based in Seattle. I joined the foundation three months ago, 
Before that, I was a lifelong journalist. Uh, most recently, about, I spent about 25 years at the Wall Street Journal in uh, different reporting and editing roles around the world. Um, I'm on this panel because we do grants to news media uh, around the world that focus on the issues we care about, which are global poverty, development, and not particularly relevant to today, but U.S. education. Um, and the, the type uh, Jailed uh, prisoner, I mean, all, all those prisoners. But it, it happened that uh, uh, there was something wrong in a way uh, uh, one, one of the, of the, of the, of the journalists had been freed, uh, despite the fact that uh, it still was listed as uh, a member of the, And so we, we, we were very transparent uh, with Amnesty and, and we discussed, we kept our own standards. Uh, we, we tried, to, we tried to, 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 to sort of make sure that we still were not the spokesperson of Amnesty International, which is a great organization, uh, but that we were working with them, sharing the same value, but at the same time keeping our own role as a newspaper, uh, being able even to be critical sometimes of some positions taken by Amnesty International. And sometimes in our editorial positions, we were not always on the same wavelength uh, than Amnesty International, though we respected the organization. This is just to show how to try to balance out, I mean, uh, advocacy, because many media, by the way, are advocating uh, things. But neutrality in the media is, is, is rough as a mirage, or it's a hypocrisy. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make sure that you keep your standards when you work with organizations that do, do not have journalism as their mandate, but has something else, which is brilliant, like human rights, uh, like, like, of course, human rights watch, or like Amnesty International. I think one point that we're all talking about is storytelling, and I, I guess it's pretty clear that lots of people in different ways are telling stories, whether they're charities, NGOs, journalists. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about telling a story about a, a situation or, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, shootings in, you know, somewhere or the fact that a series of people have been targeted or an illness or, or various stories. I think... Um, NGOs don't necessarily do that in a different way to, to journalists. I mean, the best ones will recognize that um, the clarity of the story, a personal story, is very effective at um, uh, getting people to understand um, what's happening and, and creating empathy. That goes on in newspapers and, and in the media and has done, you know, as long as I can remember, there was always, you know, here's the data, here's the numbers, here's a person and that this has happened to who's going to tell you about it. I mean, the combination it continues to be really effective and um, just because people respond in different ways to numbers and to people. Um, I suppose what we're talking about here is that there are maybe more actors um, covering hard news stories on a daily basis, um, worked in many kinds of media over the years, and also like Jean-Paul, took uh, five, six years out working for think tanks in a research, editorial, um, publications, and communication, social media, all those kind of things. Um, I've been working in broadcast for 20 years. I'm now director of the European Journalism Center, so have I left the newsroom? Yes, have I left journalism? No. The question is, I think, as journalists, we started off with this, you know, detached view on things, and now we do advocacy, in a sense, or we have an issue we want to get across. How does that sit with this notion of objectivity, of being uh, equally detached to everybody? You want me to go? go, go. Um, look, when you do, to be a good news reporter or editor, you just have to be accurate and fair and deep and probing. And you can do that if you're an advocacy journalist or you can do that if you're a more mainstream journalist. You just have to do good work, be decent about it, and so on. Um, at the foundation, at the Gates Foundation, some of our grants are to mainstream media, so to, so to speak, that have more of the traditional protocols of attempting to be neutral and objective, and some of them are to slightly more issue-oriented news organizations. Um, the key is to just make sure that they're principled professionals. Um, we actually don't, are not very hands-on 
with the journalists. So once we give a grant to a news organization to cover, let's say, women and girls issues or global health issues or agriculture or whatever it is, once we've established the broad parameters, we actually trust them to do what they're going to do and we don't contact them on a daily basis and say, oh, we didn't like that story or, you know, we're going to yank that grant if you don't do a story we want. We, we are neutral and hands off and the reason we can be is because there are plenty of news organizations out there across the spectrum that are credible and serious and some of them are traditional, some of them are non-traditional. I mean, there's this discussion about constructive journalism or, or journalists who, have, who, who want to change things for the better instead of just reporting the mess, as it were. Well, just to say really quickly, and then I won't dominate, uh, we find actually that audiences 